I want to um, uh, start this morning. Maybe we can just um, pray again for a moment. We ask the Lord, the Holy Spirit, to help us to be present with us at this time. We glorify the Father through Jesus Christ for his, the great work that he's been doing through you, the people here. And we, we glorify God and thank him for that grace and for that blessing. And we ask the Holy Spirit now to help us um, continue the rest of the morning. We thank you. I want to take this opportunity again to thank everyone because uh, it's pro it's, we've got another meeting next week, which is Christmas meeting. I know some people will start to go away. Um, already people are starting to go away, but um, I want to thank everyone for your support this year. Um, it's been probably the year, a year that I haven't, we haven't been around as often as we normally are. Uh, normally I have a rule that I don't, not away here, away more than six or seven times on a Sunday. But um, things are changing slowly here and it, it was necessary we were away for a lot longer. But I want to go back to what we said two weeks ago when we were speaking about Ephesians 6, about um, finally growing strong in the Lord. And um, I want to stress the importance of that. And in the ensuing two weeks, we've had a lot of spiritual attack going on because we've been making a lot of progress, particularly in our prayer. The prayer that we've had here over the last 18 months has been enormous. It's been really uh, a, a, a breaker in the spirit. And, and the fruit of that prayer is starting to come to life now. And there are many great things. And what you just heard about the Philippines is just one of many, but that, that, that was a great witness. That's very encouraging, the, the, what you shared there, the four of you. And it goes to show, too, again, that we love the whole church. We're not stuck on one aspect of the church. We love the whole church. That's really Christ's heart, and that's what we're about here. And so when we uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 6, we, talk, we, we speak about spiritual warfare, of course, and I spoke about that, the importance of not just saying Ephesians 6, but actually living Ephesians 6, integrity and righteousness, and those things have to be part of our life. And I think one of the things that came through this year recently was the importance of worshipping God. And I sent that, that prophecy to all of you because we all have many intentions. But what we can do with all those intentions is lift them up to God and worship him. And in that worship, we get the breakthrough. And that's why we'd like people to come in. See, I, we extended the worship this morning a little bit. And you can see the difference it makes. Because the devil is trying to rob us of worshipping him. So if, we, if we're tempted not to come in, then please remember that that might be what's happening. Because when you go to about an hour and worship, you start to get a breakthrough usually. You know, at least 45 minutes. It's, 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 it's not like a rule, but it's, it, 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 it tends to happen that way. Because when we focus on the Lord, the Lord starts to break things. We don't have to ask him for so much specific things because he breaks them because we're focused on him. Now, one of the aspects of spiritual warfare, and we can stand and we can fight the devil, praying in tongues, that's great. I do that from time to time. But it's the integrity, it's truth, it's praying in the spirit, it's doing all those things as it says in Ephesians 6. It's not only saying that scripture, but living, but one of the keys to all of it, to all of that, we can do all that and still fail to defeat demonic power, is humility. Humility is the, is the door that opens up God's grace. To the Jews, it was the supreme virtue because everything depended on it. And so I want to take us uh, this, this, uh, this afternoon, now it's after 12 o'clock, to um, a scripture in Luke chapter 18, which is well known. It's perhaps after 
the Good Samaritan and the parable of the prodigal son, the most known parable, and that's the parable of the publican and the Pharisee. And in, in Luke 18, Jesus um, um, tells this parable, and it's in the context of humility. It's after it, he also talks about the little children. And the word there in the Greek that's used for little children is children from basically uh, babes to, to about two and a half, three years of age. And he says we have to be like one of those to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So very, very young children. And so I want someone who can really read well to come forward now and read for me Luke chapter 18, verses 9 um, to 17. Who's, who's going to do that for me? Steve Noon. Steve Noon. Come on, Steve. <laughs> You can read it in this Jerusalem version. He spoke the following parable to some people who prided themselves on being virtuous and despised everyone else. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood there and said this prayer to himself. I thank you, God, that I am not grasping, unjust, adulterous like the rest of mankind, and particularly that I am not like this tax collector here. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes on all I get. The tax collector stood some distance away, not daring even to raise his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This man, I tell you, went home, uh, went home again at rights with God. The other did not. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the man who humbles himself will be exalted. Thank you. Can we just put that there? Okay, so that, I mean, it's self evident what the moral of the parable is, but there's just a couple of points that might help us here to uh, understand this parable. Um, again, two people can be doing the same thing. One is an effective communi communication with God, another one an ineffective. The other thing I th believe the Lord is trying to speak to us is that it's important for us to be effective with the presence of God and allowing the presence of God to actually change us, not just to say and do the religious things, but to actually have change in our life. And one of the ways is to address our thinking. Because many a time we think religiously on a Sunday and we think out of the old man for the rest of the week. We, we think, you know, through anxiety or fear or, or whatever. I and mean, there's no change. We keep doing the same things. Now, it's still helpful to pray it's still helpful to go to church. It's still helpful to read the Word of God. Because if we don't do that, we'll slip further. Maybe slip right away from God. But those things in themselves, without really allowing the Holy Spirit to penetrate the heart and to change the way we think about things, will not bring change to us personally. And therefore, we'll, we will not have victory in our life and forever struggling in the spiritual life. So we have two people here who pray. One, one, you know, could be any typical churchgoer today. He's um, a good prayer. He fasts. He tithes. He does all the things that we're supposed to consider in church life. But his prayer does not connect with God at all. Because his prayer isn't, well, he, he says, he, he addresses it to God. He says, I thank you, God. So that's, a, that, that's something that we can give him. We can tick that part off. But then he goes on and he becomes, his prayer is comparing himself to others. 
And that's always wrong because we can compare ourselves to some other group or to some other person. But the only pe person we have to compare ourselves to and the only thing we have to compare ourselves to is God and his word and the way he wants us to live. We, we're always looking for, our, for, for growth. I'm always looking to go deeper with God. I'm not satisfied to remain as I was 10 years ago. It's not good for anyone. Not good for me, not good for God, not good for my wife, not good for anyone, not good for you. If I remained as I was 10 years ago, it's not good for anyone. And it's the same for you. It's not good for you to begin with because God wants you to grow. So if we speak the way we did 10 years ago, if we dress the way we dressed 10 years ago, if we, if we uh, uh, watch certain television shows that we did 10 years ago, maybe there isn't growth in our life. We have to see what God can do for us because we're still thinking in the old way, in the old man. And so that's one word that's been coming through more and more. But here we have a man who, who for all purposes, is doing okay. He's not covetous. I mean, he's not, he's not you know, looking at his neighbour's wife or his neighbour's possessions. He's, he's, he's a just man. He's not unjust, he says that. He doesn't commit adultery. And, 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 and on top of that, he's not like the rest, everyone else. Particularly not like the bloke at the back. <laughs> not, not like him at all. So he, he, he's doing pretty well. He thinks he's doing pretty well. Because he's, he's, he's coming from a base of pride. He's not, he's not coming from a base of a brokenness or connecting with God. And, and the other man simply says at the back of the, the, uh, the temple, he says, you know, um, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, a man who needed God. Now, there's, there's, one, there's one talk that I always consider one of the best ever, and that is one by Derek Prince called Dependence on God. It sort of has always had a big impact in my life and still does. Because the, uh, that talk is relevant for every part of my life. I, I need to be totally dependent on God in every facet of my life, in every time of my life. It's not just when I began, when I needed him when I need to know his righteousness, I need him all the time. Because if I don't have him, then self will come through. I need God. I need God to be talking now through me, not me. I need God to get up in the morning. I need God uh, to sleep even. I need God uh, to praise him. I can't praise him effectively without his help. I need him in my a relationship with Julie. I need him in my relationship with my family, with you. I can't just do it. You know, a lot of a lot of modern churches, uh, 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 you know, can be run a bit like a business. We can run this place like a business too. And there is a certain element that we have to because of compliance. But that would be a tragedy, a tragedy, if we ran it just as an organisation as an, and as a you know, administration. We could do it. We've got enough people here who could run it like a corporation. And we could get more people through here. But will they be disciples? Will they be people who really know God? Will they be people who love their wife and their husband and love their family? Will they be people who love the brethren? Will they be people who love the whole church? Will they be people who reached out to the poor, like you've done? Will they be those sorts of people? Because that's the disciple, you see. So getting back to this man, it's interesting because he says, Lord, have mercy on me. Now the Greek word there normally is elios, which, you know, in the, for those who are Catholic, in the Mass, when we say, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, that's actually not in Latin, it's in Greek. It's, even in, in, when they used to say, Mass, Latin, they kept that part in Greek. And it says, you know, Lord have mercy. Kyrie eleison, coming from the word mercy. It, the word in the scripture for mercy 
is Elios. It's, it's the word that, that means mercy. But here we have another word. And that is the word hilasterion, which has a greater meaning. It's not just God have mercy on me, a sinner. It's Lord, you have paid the price for me, a sinner. You, Lord, have been my mercy seat. You, Lord, have taken on my iniquity and my sin. You have taken on my life. You have redeemed me. So this man was greatly graced because he wasn't just acknowledging his sin and asking for God's mercy. He was actually in a knowledge that God had actually paid for his sin. It's extraordinary really and it's only one other time, I think it's in Hebrews 2.18, that this word is used in the New Testament and it is to denote Jesus being our mercy seat. There's a great gulf here between these two. Extraordinary gulf. Bigger than even is apparent when we read it. It's a great spiritual gulf. There's a man who is so full of his own righteousness and a man who knows that his righteousness is in God. Extraordinary gulf. And, um, you know, and what goes with that is something called generosity. The publican had a generous heart. You think, well, oh, this Pharisee, he did pretty well. He does all Phil's teachings. Don't you, Phil? (laughs) He's a generous man. No, he's not generous at all. So you can be generous with money and be the most stingy person on earth. Stingy with your emotions. Stingy with your house. Stingy with your car. Stingy with relationships. Stingy in every other way. Calculated. Measured. But to be a generous person means we're generous in every area of our life. My time, my money, everything, my house. And I want to thank all the people, particularly who have people, you know, when we ask for for, for billeting, because that's a big thing today with all the things that, you know, have happened in the church at large. You're really exhibiting generosity, a generous heart. So this this man is extremely generous in his heart. He's a a bad man, he knows that. He knows he's fallen. He, He was a despised man. He was a traitor. He worked for the Romans, okay? He wasn't somebody that was well liked in society. The Pharisee would have had high profile because the Pharisees actually were the reform movement of Judaism. Their, 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 their beginnings were great. They deteriorate like all human nature does. After a while, things go a little bit corrupt. So he had high standing in society. The other man had no standing and yet his heart, Jesus said, this man went home more acceptable to God than the other because his heart was full of generosity. He was, he was prepared, prepared to acknowledge his weaknesses and was prepared to acknowledge that he himself could not make himself righteous. We can go on and we can talk a lot about this and then, you know, um, Jesus makes the obvious statement and the statement at the end of a parable always, or the, or the first uh, sentence which tells us, um, you know, what the parable is about, um, usually tells us, so the first verse says he spoke the following parable to some people who pride themselves on being virtuous and despised everyone else. And then at the end, he says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the man who humbles himself will be exalted. So in that, um, the, the reason for the parable and the moral of the parable at the end. And this is a parable, 
Okay? Um, again, there probably were people like that, but it's a parable. But the, the, it's not, the point is not whether it's a parable. The point is it's giving us spiritual truth. And then he talked about, he emphasizes that people even brought little children for him to touch them. But when the disciples saw this, they turned them away. You see, they were not generous, these disciples. That was, that was evidence that they were not generous people. Again, they didn't want to be bothered with these children. Get them out of my way. Very, 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 very ungracious, really. See, this is, what, this is where the Lord addresses my heart and your heart. We could have been the apostles there. You would have thought they would have been really, really great people. But they were not a generous bunch by and large. You know, Jesus had to work on them. So they wanted to get rid of them because they weren't generous. Again, get this thing out of your mind that generosity is about giving money. And that's only part of it. All right? Yes, we need to be generous with money, and that's great. But we can be generous with money, and there are some very rich people in the world that are very generous with money, but they're very ungenerous with everything else in their heart. There's no generosity in their heart. Giving money is is something they think is good and they do it. We thank God for that. We always thank God for what is good. We don't deride it. But it doesn't mean that they're generous people. Here we have Jesus then calling the little children to him and saying, let the little children come to me and do not stop them, for it is to such as the kingdom of God belongs. I tell you solemnly, anyone who does not welcome the kingdom like a little child will never enter it. So, you know, we enter the kingdom of God like children. We don't, it's not about complicated thinking. It's about a humble heart, acknowledging our sin, acknowledging we need to turn around to turn from sin to God. But here again, we see an example of a lack of generosity. There's a lack of generosity in the Pharisee. There's a lack of generosity in the apostles. And Jesus, Jesus rebukes that. So the challenge for me and you, particularly over this Christmas time, is are we a generous person? Now, just don't go and buy a hamper, okay? Because, <laughs> of course, that's not what I'm talking about. We have to look at it in my heart. Am I generous with my time? Am I generous... With my, you know, in, in my relationships, am I generous with my home? Do I just connect here with the head, or do I connect with the heart? When I'm asked to, to, to do something, a ministry, you know, maybe I shouldn't do it, and we have to pray about everything. We can't do everything, but maybe I say no because I'm not generous, because I want my time to myself. Whatever the case may be. There's another reading here which I came across from 2 Timothy 3 which I thought might be relevant to, to, to read considering that you know, we are going through perilous times in the world. Um, I'll just read it very briefly. Um, and um, you know, I hope it does connect with what I'm saying. It may not connect as much as I'd like to but... Um, from 2 Timothy 3, um, the dangers of these times. You may be quite sure that in the last days people will be lovers of self. Um, well, I'll, I'll, don't, don't jump, wait a minute. You may be quite sure that in the last days there are going to be some difficult times. Now, I'm not saying we're in the last, last days. We're in the last days because from Jesus till the end is the last days. But obviously we're closer than they were 2,000 years ago. People will be self-centred. That means lovers of self. Grasping, which means greedy. Again, not generous. Boastful. 
don't boast, arrogant and rude. You know, I went to collect something this week from a government department. And Julie and I had to go the day before. And we had a very lovely lady serve us. And she was probably, um, I think, Filipino. She was very lovely. She, she was very well-mannered. When I went to pick up the documents the next day, I had someone and who didn't, was very, very rude and no thank you, nothing. So it's not, not pleasant when we experience that, is it? Disobedient to their parents. Mm, that's another one. Ungrateful. Irreligious, which means not paying reverence to the things of God when, you know, and that could be the meeting here. Uh, when God is moving, and when God we're worshipping, heartless, that means without compassion, uh, unappeasable, slanderers. Now this word I can hardly pronounce here, but it's people without self-control. Savages, enemies of everything that is good. And there's a, you know, when we look around, uh, not, I mean not here, when we look around society, they will be treacherous and reckless and demented by pride, preferring their own pleasure to God. It's pretty strong. You know, when you hear the news, all you hear is about this murder and that murder and that murder and, you know, it's about half the news. They will keep an outward appearance of religion. Again, as we talked about that, we don't want an outward appearance. We want a change of heart, but have rejected the inner power of it have nothing to do with people like that. And then he talks about, of the same kind too, there are, there, are, there, are, there are those men who insinuate themselves into families in order to get influence over women who are obsessed with their sins and, and follow one craze after another in an attempt to educate themselves but can never come to the knowledge of the truth. Men like this defy the truth, just as Yanis and Jambres defied Moses. Their minds are corrupt and their fate spurious, but they will not be able to go on any longer. Their foolishness, like that of the other two, must become obvious to everyone. So you see, we can't live like the world. That's the way the world's going. So we can't live like that during the week and then live like... Christians on Sunday. This is one of the big things that God's been speaking to us about. There's got to be a change in our culture, in our culture, to the way we think, to the way we dress, to the way we conduct ourselves in public places. All these things are important to the way we look at, uh, at things. We just don't accept what the television or the radio station tells us. Go and check some things out. Do a fact check on some of the things you listen to and find out what's really going on behind the scenes. Don't accept them because they're not always true. And so, anyway, that's not the way we're going. We're going a different way. We're going the way of Jesus Christ. We're going the way, hopefully, of the publican. And it's not about how good or bad we are in the long run. It's about where our heart is. For where your heart is, there is your treasure also. Uh, last but not least, I will say something about the supernatural. And I know this is a bit of a smorgasbord. But the supernatural... We're supernatural people. We're spiritual people. And because of that, because that's what we believe exists, most of the people out there don't believe it. Or if they do believe it in the spiritual, they believe in the spiritual without repentance. The difference between us and any other spiritual group who's interested in spiritual things is we believe in repentance. That means repentance, turning away from sin and turning to God with then the supernatural 
experience and benefits. And that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is about. If we do not believe in a supernatural world and a spiritual world, we will never, ever enter into the baptism of the Holy Spirit because the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a, a, a result of a fact, of reality, that there is a spiritual world. And we're going to enter that spiritual world. We're not just going to stay outside it because it's there anyway and it's going to impact us. And if we don't have the weapons, we're not going to be able to fight it. So we, we desire the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The first thing about baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is the doorway into this supernatural world, is repentance. Is repentance. That's what Jesus says. Repent and believe the kingdom of God is close at hand. But it's a desire then for God's supernatural life. Without that desire for the supernatural life, we will never be fully baptised in the Holy Spirit. And with it then goes faith, because we have to believe God. It's an act of faith. And then thirdly, we have to cooperate with God and open our mouth and pray and enter by our own response of our free will. And that's how we get baptised in the Holy Spirit. That's how we get immersed. But if you don't want it, or you only want part of it, you'll only get that part because you have to have a deep desire for it. When I was baptised in the Holy Spirit, I had a deep desire for God to do something in my life. In fact, it was so deep that for two years I was high on God. Now, God had to then bring me down and deal with issues in my life. So you don't remain there. But it was a deep desire with repentance to experience God because I believed that God was the only one that could change me and restore me. There was no one else that could do it. If we don't come to that place, this is again no different than the the publican. Because it's a place of dependence on God. It's a place of desiring God and desiring him and his ways above all others. And when we go back to the publican, when we go back to the tax collector, he knew that he had no righteousness. He had no righteousness. He was an outcast. He, he, He was considered a traitor. He was considered working for the other side. He was considered working with the oppressors of the Jewish people. He was not favoured by anyone. And he would have probably taken his own cut. The Romans didn't care less. They put high taxes on the people and they picked the right people to do the job for them. And whatever those people took above that, they couldn't care less as long as they got their money. He was a despised man. But see, he knew his need for God. And deep down, deep down, because God looks at the heart and man looks at outward appearance, there was a generosity in his heart, a generosity that had not been tapped yet. But God at that moment tapped that generosity and opened up that fountain of generosity in his life. And there was another tax collector that Jesus had into his house. Jesus, remember, taxpayers and sinners um, were some of his best friends. Okay, now, um, I don't have much more to say. But but again, to finish off where I started and as to say this, that spiritual warfare begins with humility, with our need for God. That the devil will not trouble me or not. He has nothing over me. No unsettled claims against me. Nothing. He's got nothing on me if I humble myself before God. Nothing. He can't touch me. Can't touch me. Without being without being, again, uh, um, what's the word, presumptuous. I, I, there's, there's, I don't fear the devil. 
I only would only have to fear the devil if I am not walking with God. I, I more fear my own self and my, my own inclinations than the devil. devil has, the devil is disarmed if we arm ourselves properly and that is by being dependent on God and knowing our, who we are in, in, in light of God. And then we can pray that prayer from Ephesians 6. We can pray in tongues and we can have total victory in every area of our life that the devil is trying to influence and the devil is trying to um, get in. Because it's what he does is, and this is where people don't understand the devil's work, because they think, you know, oh, I'm not possessed. No, you're not possessed. That's, that's absolutely right. Hardly anyone's possessed. There are some people... If you, if you met them, you'd know them. Um, but the devil works. Uh, and some, I've, I've met some people who have been infested. But uh, most of us are not. But what we do is, because of certain weaknesses and certain pride and certain lack of dependence on God, the devil gets a foothold. He, 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 get, he, he, he comes in to the side and he pressures us. And we then need deliverance from that. Because then he has control of that area of our life and he, our will doesn't work so well in that area of our life because he's moved in to try to, um, uh, you know, put the boot in. But he's easily dealt with if we repent and we're humble because we just get delivered. That's it. And that's all there is to it. There's nothing, nothing uh, extraordinary in one sense because... All of us have had deliverance. I've had deliverance. It's uh, helped me a lot, okay? So try it. <laughs> it's very helpful.